And thank you for all of you, that uh, the ones that took a trip to come today to Hamburg and also to Hamburgers. <laughs> Uh, I'm Nilo Farvadiati, Research Fellow at Digital City Science um, in Hoffman City University. And I want to start the panel by thanking you for your time today that you brought, uh, your interest, your care, um, your work, and also your attention. Um, I believe you're standing um, at a pivotal moment in the development of research and digital urbanism as uh, digital technology from platforms, data, algorithm, um, computational process, and informational infrastructure are not only transforming the way cities are conceived, imagined, designed, and operated, but also transforming our understanding um, and experiencing of everyday life in cities um, to human and other than human agential bodies. These post-human and technological forms of agency, the inequality with which they are entangled is shifting the focus of a scholarship toward um, understanding the complex of embodiment of digital mediated lives, which for us as researcher also, I think, necessitates not just uh, we adopt to new methods and tools, but also epistemological rethinking. Um, the digital technology have also led to what is best described as an, as an enthusiasm of practice, um, something which is exciting, something which, as uh, for example, uh, Casey here stated, may be unruly, or indeed something which may be just becoming possible as new technology or networks allow to diving in, or to comments practicing to see what's emerged for larger agenda or emancipatory aspiration. If we call it the practice-led research paradigm or performative research, we can uh, say that um, the necessity of performative research paradigm can be derived from the linguistic or cognitive uh, meaning-making capacity of this digital term from purely human objects to an entangled possession with human and other human agential bodies that um, calls for new positioning for us as researchers. Um, so that can be actually a good news for some of us, some, some of the uh, that are becoming a little impatient with long-lasting ideas of disembodied distance and neutral position as researcher in the traditional qualitative paradigm. But the challenges uh, also come with that. And, uh, going to uh, digital urbanism and sovereignty movement in refusing to tech corporate smart cities, we are facing the dual challenges that we uh, want to conduct situated, engaged research with digitally mediated everyday life, but also we want to make sense of this complex, cloudy, and material and immaterial technological system uh, that are heavily controlled by uh, private companies. All that has been said, the panel today intends to look at the practices of digital sovereignty, not as the object of the study, but rather as a method of research. It is particularly interested um, in performative research methods, repurposing the traditional qualitative methods, and careful maneuver the presenters today have taken during their empirical work slash activism. Um, our first presentation will begin by the question of subjectivity and positionality of a researcher among technological sovereignty collectives in Berlin, which will be presented by Dr. Casey Lynch. Um, he's the uh, assistant professor of digitalization and society at the University of Twente, whose research path has been dedicated to criticizing dominant process of digitalization, in particular those based on surveillance, extraction, and corporate control. So uh, by way of a, a brief introduction into the tech sovereignty movement in Barcelona and my research on it, uh, this was the topic of my PhD dis uh, dissertation in geography at the University of Arizona um, between 2015 and 2019. Um, some background about the, um, uh, the sort of situation of, of tech sovereignty in Barcelona. So starting around uh, 2010, 2011, Barcelona was kind of proclaimed uh, a premier smart city um, it was one of the first cities to uh, form partnerships with Cisco and IBM and other large companies. Uh, this was under a, a sort of right of center, um, very um, uh, entrepreneurial uh, uh, municipal um, uh, uh, administration at the time. 
Um, and so, uh, but this was also in t- about 2011, where in this sort of smart city program began in Barcelona. Uh, it was also a, a period of social and political upheaval uh, in Barcelona. So there was the sort of Occupy movement in the U.S., but this was the Indignados movement in Spain. So you had um, both in Madrid and Barcelona and other cities in Spain um, a rise of, of social movement activity um, that really kind of coincided, actually, sort of parallel to um, this very uh, neoliberal smart city vision that. The municipal government was pushing at the time. Um, in 2015, uh, the city elected a uh, housing activist, uh, Ada Colau, who had been really involved in uh, stopping evictions uh, uh, in the city during that period in 20, uh, 2011 through 2015. She was elected mayor um, of Barcelona and really uh, set out to, um, to uh, change the course of, of the city. Um, but also in, in terms of sort of setting the scene a bit in Barcelona, there's a, a long history of community organizing and activism in the city, um, including right uh, some that are, are perhaps direct, um, directly related to uh, digital sovereignty, as we'll discuss, uh, like the free and open source, uh, open source software movement, um, o- open culture movements, uh, and so on. But also a lot of very grounded um, uh, neighborhood-based associations uh, have long been a very powerful, a powerful actor in the city. Um, across Catalonia, there's a long history of cooperativism and uh, all kind of alternative um, enterprises. And so there's this sort of um, situation uh, uh, there as well. Um, and then uh, getting a bit closer here, we see the emergence of tech sovereignty really uh, as it art- was articulated there um, as a discourse beginning in 2014, 2015 really. Um, quite a bit before the municipality actually adopted that. So I think often in some of the other writing that I sometimes see about tech sovereignty in Barcelona, a lot of credit is given to the uh, municipal administration, whereas uh, the idea behind tech sovereignty, the sort of discourse, the way that that was really taken up within the city um, started several years before that was uh, addressed by the municipality and really um, uh, sort of emerged out of the, uh, the grassroots, right? From uh, Calafau post-industrial, um, eco post-industrial district, uh, which is a, a sort of interesting experimental space on the outskirts of the city, um, as well as, um, uh, yeah, amongst uh, multiple activists in the city. Um, one of my favorite sort of definitions of, of tech sovereignty uh, um, from within that sort of activist uh, uh, strain uh, comes from uh, Marga Padilla, who writes, right, the question of tech sovereignty for her is the question uh, we wish to discuss is who has the power to make decisions about te- technologies, uh, about their development, about their use, about access and about distribution, about supply and consumption, about the prestige they have and their power to fascinate. Uh, it's still one of my favorite quotes uh, to this day, uh, is sort of setting out what this really uh, entails, right? What the, the topic, at least at this period in Barcelona, is really sort of meaning um, to people uh, on the ground. Um, and so uh, my question, the question of my dissertation, which in retrospect I look back and I think, well, not the best formulated question, right? Uh, but uh, what really sort of uh, guided me on this research as I, I started in 2015 or so was, um, you know, coming from a, a background more in um, sort of critical development studies and urban geography, uh, uh, focus on, on uh, Central America, but really uh, without much focus on tech or digitalization in, in any way. Um, the question I set out was, uh, to answer or, or address really was uh, whether or not digital technologies are inherently tools of technocratic governance, surveillance, and capital accumulation, or how they might um, become loci for imagining and building alternative uh, digital futures. So, um, and then I, I conducted uh, ethnographic research in Barcelona really between 2016 and, and 2019. Um, in terms of what tech sovereignty in Barcelona looks like um, in practice, right, um, we see really by 2018 really a, an explosion of, of activity between 2014 and, and say 2019. Um, some of these groups are ones that, that predate, so uh, sort of helped inspire uh, later movements, but we see a really uh, explosion of collectives, of cooperatives, of commons-based um, uh, projects. Uh, really dealing with everything from infrastructure and hardware. So we have Gifinet, uh, community wireless network. Um, it's been actually around since the early 2000s, um, but we see that expand to things like the Things Network, so a uh, sort of community-operated um, uh, Internet of Things network in the city, often doing sort of um, environmental sensing, um, 
common cloud, so uh, uh, hosting um, commons-based um, uh, cloud infrastructure, um, and many, many more. A lot of um, sort of uh, independent autonomous servers and, and so on. Um, to uh, cooperatives, uh, workers' cooperatives of programmers and, and people developing uh, digital tools and, and sort of web services, uh, to reuse and recycling, to sort of um, uh, platform cooperativism, right? So using sort of um, platforms, digital platforms to organize uh, cooperatives sort of across economic sectors from local food through mobility to uh, delivery services and so on. Uh, to all kinds of education and training, um, as well as uh, several groups that really pr uh, sprout up just to, to sort of reflect and theorize, sort of coordinate um, uh, things around this idea of um, tech sovereignty. And so, um, and so, uh, my my research was really trying to sort of understand what was going on here. It's, it was, you know, there's no coordination really amongst these groups, but there's a lot of overlap, um, a lot of uh, moments of, of people coming together and, and sharing knowledge, a lot of people who are sort of involved in two or three different projects, and so there really is a, a kind of extensive network um, involved in these uh, different groups, which I imagine have expanded or I know have expanded quite a bit. Since then, some of these have been renamed and moved on to other things, right? It's quite experimental, but this is a, a rough list uh, based on around 2018. Um, so the question of performativity of, of what I was sort of doing in this research, I guess, um, or really kind of reflecting on, I guess, multiple aspects of performativity. Um, you know, the first uh, thing that I can say is that the, the sort of whole idea behind the project uh, was very much informed by the uh, notion of performativity of knowledge uh, as, as discussed by uh, feminist economic geogra uh, geographers, uh, J.K. Gibson Graham, um, who write, write that the, this vision of performativity of knowledge, uh, its implication and what it purports to describe, its productive power of making, has placed new responsibility on the shoulders of scholars, right? So if knowledge is performative, then those of us producing knowledge um, have a, a different responsibility that we need to be considering. Um, that, not, that responsibility, right, is to recognize their constitutive role in the worlds that exist and their power to bring new worlds into being, not single-handedly, of course, but alongside other world makers, both in and outside the academy, right? So if we're producing knowledge, that knowledge has impacts on the world, right, or potentially, right, has impacts on the world, shapes discussions, shapes the way that people act. And so um, specifically in thinking about sort of alternative economic projects, post-capitalist, non-capitalist uh, non economic projects, uh, they really uh, highlight this idea of performativity of, of knowledge. And so their, their goal in, in doing research on post-capitalist economies, uh, often in more sort of rural settings or sort of smaller settings, often really uh, not engaging the digital in their case, but uh, is to make them the focus of research and teaching in order to make them more real, more credible, more viable as objects of policy and activism, more present as everyday realities that touch all of our lives and dynamically shape our futures. Um, this is the performative ontological project of diverse economies. So um, this is sort of uh, these readings, right? Uh, Gibson Graham's work uh, were really kind of formative in my, my education, right? Uh, really sort of shaped my approach to research um, from the beginning. And so I, I do sort of start from um, this as a base. Um, but of course, performativity, um, you know, means various things in different contexts. Um, and of course, right, uh, is, is highly, uh, you know, uh, means quite a bit for how we think about subjectivity, right, has uh, really shaped the way that we, we think about subjectivity. Um, and so beyond the sort of performativity of knowledge, um, I'm also interested in the sort of performativity of, of subjectivities, right, and what it means to be a certain kind of digital subject. So in my, my uh, research into the tech sovereignty movement in Barcelona, I was interested in how uh, space economies and subjectivities were being shaped uh, sort of through these practices. Um, and so of course, right, subjectivity is also a question of performativity. It's this reiterative citational practice, right, uh, through which conceptions of the self emerge in relation to normative discourses and the ways that they're enacted, right? So how do we actually, um, you know, come to understand ourselves as, as subjects, uh, position ourselves, understand our place um, in the world, uh, and so on. And uh, this is, I think, an open question, or has uh, often been uh, posed as an open question regarding some of the, um, in some of the other literature on digital sovereignty in Barcelona in particular. Uh, 
it was very nice to have this article come out right as I was submitting an article uh, that said the open question is whether or not uh, uh, tech sovereignty in Barcelona is um, engendering new forms of subjectivity. And I thought, thank you <laughs> for setting up my work for me and, and uh, explaining uh, why, my, uh, you know, why my research makes sense. Um, and so I do think that that was a, a big, uh, an important question to ask is uh, we can talk about digital sovereignty, we can talk about tech sovereignty, um, how does that actually change people's understandings of themselves, their practices, the way that they interact in the world, right, um, and, and so on. And so I, I reflected a bit on how uh, mainstream digital subjectivities are shaped, right, uh, in my paper on, on digital subjectivity. Um, and I talked about how in, in digital capitalism, subjects are understood as programmable, right, that uh, our data allows uh, through, you know, algorithmic means we can be known as certain kinds of subjects and uh, enrolled in different kinds of processes through our data traces and so on, um, that we can be predictable um, and that we uh, engage in that often, right, that we uh, become sort of responsibilized entrepreneurial digital subjects. Um, we both engage in sort of data practices, offering our data, um, perhaps to smart city programs, um, but we're also uh, considered uh, sort of told to be entrepreneurial and responsible and perhaps learn digital tools in order to uh, integrate in the workforce in a particular way, right, or uh, become marketable uh, as a worker. Um, we're uh, often sort of told that uh, we have to sort of choose between being technically oriented or socially and politically oriented, right, that those are, are sort of separate things. And so there's a lot of discursive work really from, I think, a young age in a lot of countries at least around, um, you know, what is your, your role? Are you an engineer? Are you a social scientist, right? Where do you fit? Uh, how do you specialize in school? Um, these are ways that performatively, right, we are sort of shaped as subjects, uh, as sort of technical subjects without, you know, a clear political, uh, uh, explicit political orientation or as a, a certain kinds of social subjects. Uh, and that these, uh, these distinctions are, of course, gendered and racialized and classed, right? And so technological knowledge is often um, uh, uh, discursively and then performatively um, understood as, as masculinized, right, as, as white, as middle class, upper class, uh, as linked to certain kinds of uh, subject positions. And so um, all of this sort of mainstream uh, digital subject positions are things that um, help uh, uphold a certain kind of order uh, of digital capitalism, I would say. Um, so I was interested in, in how, and this is, there's all kinds of literatures that I drew all this from, right? But I was interested in how, and whether or not basically in, in the tech sovereignty movement uh, in Barcelona, these things were really being actively challenged. Um, and, and so I look at, uh, I'll get quite uh, quickly to my own sort of reflection on this, but in terms of some of the writing that I've done on this, I have looked at uh, the practices by which different kinds of people were uh, involved in, in the movement, were leading the movement, uh, kind of how they came from technical backgrounds or social work backgrounds or political backgrounds, um, how, they, how they questioned um, some of these hierarchies of, of knowledge, how they questioned the way that technical knowledge and social knowledge is, were um, discursively sort of separated. Uh, and so on. And so there's just a couple of examples here of the way that you can see uh, that a lot of the, the tech sovereignty movement in Barcelona, a lot of these uh, activities are really focused around sort of care of the self, people sort of creating, uh, uh, engaging in different kinds of digital practices and becoming different kinds of digital subjects. So um, here there's a poster from an, an anti-mobile uh, world congress um, a list of events and you can see a lot of these are about um, you know, understanding you know, your sort of role as a worker in the digital economy and so on and how that can be different. Uh, this is a, a poster from the GIFINET network, so the Community Wireless Network, and it you know, explicitly says down here in Catalan, uh, you know, this is a space of learning uh, where women, migrants, uh, children, men, and, and obvious would be like grandparents, older people um, can contribute. Um, is here an install party, right, uh, where people install um, open source uh, software in their, on their machines, right, or uh, also often uh, repair their machines. And they do it, uh, they learn how to do it themselves, right? So they learn how to actually uh, do these things, why they should be doing these things, right, what the sort of values are behind different kinds of choices that they're making, um, and how they can work with others, how they can um, uh, learn new skills themselves, share those skills. 
uh, and so on. So there's a lot of activities that are really focused on, uh, on building skills, not for the sort of workforce, but for uh, uh, sort of cultivating a, a certain, a different kind of relationship to digital technologies. Uh, this is a screenshot from the Ateneos de Fabricacio, which are um, community maker spaces uh, in Barcelona that are actually sponsored by the, um, by the uh, municipality, um, one of the few that I focus on that, that are actually municipal programs, um, but that are very much focused on, um, on people coming together, people sharing knowledge on sort of social outcomes on, uh, and, and learning. So aprenacha down here means learning. And there's a lot of focus on learning and, and learning not for sort of professionalization, but learning for uh, uh, the ways that it can um, affect communities and so on. So there's a lot of focus actually at this level of, of subjectivity, I, I think, uh, amongst these collectives in, in Barcelona. So uh, uh, I'll try to be quick here, but my, uh, my sort of reflection on this in terms of uh, uh, the, the sort of question of um, uh, the role of the researcher and sort of performative research um, is that uh, I think my role in a lot of this was really as a learner myself and as a sort of um, uh, uh, becoming unruly digital subject myself, right? In a sense, I, I did not have, um, you know, I, I very much was a uh, just a, a participant in a lot of this, um, and I had to learn a lot along the way myself, right? So I really did not know anything about how the internet worked before going into this, right? Uh, in terms of the hardware, the backbone, right? I really had no idea. Um, I was quite in the dark um, to all of that, and then I had to learn to build and maintain my own internet infrastructure, right, with my neighbors in my in my uh, in my neighborhood. I, this is a sort of uh, kind of mental map of uh, the local uh, network in my specific neighborhood that I was uh, most directly involved in, sort of building and maintaining. So all these sort of blue um, are sort of client nodes, and then we have these super nodes that are actually relaying signals. Um, to individual houses, so we use a lot of these large antennas on the top of roofs and then smaller antennas um, on individual balconies or on the roofs of, uh, of buildings that then receive signals um, that can then uh, uh, supply houses or whole buildings or um, uh, whole areas with uh, internet connectivity. So um, I had to learn a lot uh, about all of this. I had to learn to install uh, these, SATA, these uh, antennae and, and maintain them and cooperate with my neighbors uh, to do it. Um, there was a lot of technical skills involved, but there was also a lot of social skills involved. There was a, a way of knowing the city that, that was required, right? I had to know uh, the laws around what, what rights you have to the, the shared roof space on your building and how to respond to neighbors uh, complaining that these were gonna you know, cause cancer or something, right? There's a whole slew of knowledges that go into sort of making something like this possible. Um, and I, as a researcher, was, had to be sort of involved in, in doing that, and there were some that I was very comfortable with and some that I was not, and it, the technical aspects for me were quite intimidating. Um, so I had to, to learn from my neighbors and teach myself and, um, and, and come to see sort of uh, internet connectivity in a very different light. Um, so, yeah, my, the whole point of this is to say that I think through the, uh, through the, the research, um, a lot of the sort of performativity that was going on was that I was actually um, sort of learning to, um, yeah, perform or, you know, uh, uh, sort of embody these uh, uh, different kinds of uh, subject position myself in relationship to digital technology, right? I sort of had the uh, theoretical uh, knowledge of technology and society are not separate and everything is, you know, complicated. And I had read all the philosophy and I had really believed all of this, but then as my, for my own sort of subject position, right, I was very uncomfortable in sort of technical spaces with technical knowledge. I felt very much more comfortable in the sort of philosophy, social theory, uh, um, you know, uh, kind of uh, world. And so I really had to force myself to uh, engage in, in different kinds of knowledge, understand different kinds of knowledge, where people were coming from with their own kinds of knowledge and, and, and try to um, understand this in a different way. And so um, I think from a, a researcher perspective, I was very much um, a sort of uh, a learner, sort of becoming an unruly digital subject alongside these people who were uh, becoming un unruly sort of digital subjects. Um, and so I think, uh, and, and people would often tell me things like, well, you know, I'm involved in this project, but I, I don't understand the technical side, or I didn't understand, I got lost in this last meeting where these three people really went on about 
why we need to upgrade the, uh, the antenna to this new antenna because it's going to allow us to do all these different things. I didn't understand any of that, but then like I did understand these parts and I would be like, yeah, no, I'm right there with you, right? Like there were parts that made me quite uncomfortable um, or I felt quite outside of my element. Um, but I think that was a, a very important um, uh, learning experience for, for myself. Um, so I'll wrap up soon, but to say um, that this has, I think, really shaped my trajectory since then. Um, I've, my research uh, has become, uh, I think, more um, active, perhaps more design-oriented, um, which is interesting to see there's a whole sort of discussion about design, experimental design uh, disciplines over here on the board. Um, but I think I've, uh, my own research has become much more um, focused on trying to bridge and understand different kinds of knowledge, challenge different forms of knowledge. Um, and so uh, the project I had going in, in Nevada for uh, the University of Nevada for the past three years, that's ongoing, although I'm, I'm sort of now further away from it, um, is working with a, a roboticist and the curators of two museums um, who during COVID really wanted a robot tour guide in the museum, which I felt very uncomfortable about, but they really wanted a robot tour guide. Um, and so we actually formed a sort of interesting interdisciplinary team to develop the robot ourselves, right? Understand what these specific museums wanted from a robot, right? What specific issues they wanted it to solve, right? What specific aesthetic choices they wanted for their museums, right? Uh, what kinds of control they wanted over uh, how the, the robot would operate uh, and worked with a, um, a quite um, a fairly critical, I would say, roboticist um, who's opposed to um, uh, commercializing his, his robots, which was an important uh, starting point for us, but it allowed us to create, a, I think, a, a quite a creative um, team of uh, artists, roboticists, museum curators, and social scientists to do a kind of experimental uh, design project. Uh, this seems like very different from the sort of ethnographic work on tech sovereignty in Barcelona, but I think is very much informed um, uh, my sort of approach to this uh, uh, in the way that I go about it, right? The way that I approach different kinds of knowledge and the uh, sort of experimental way of trying to put them together and thinking and I think m more creative ways about um, digital social futures or whatever. Um, and then as a sort of a last point is that I now uh, teach at a technical university and I teach engineers. Um, I teach engineers and philosophers um, actually is the, the sort of interesting point I think. So I, I teach in a master's of philosophy of science, technology and society program um, where I think sometimes uh, I, I encounter some philosophizing without necessarily uh, uh, an attempt at understanding the kinds of technical knowledge uh, that they're actually philosophizing about. Uh, and then I also obviously encounter a number of engineers who don't necessarily see how they're, uh, you know, they're just engineering, they're just solving a problem. They don't necessarily want to think deeper. And so I haven't been in this job long, but I'd say it's very much uh, one of my ongoing challenges is to think about how the sort of unruly digital subjectivities might um, inform my, my teaching uh, in, 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 in engineering school. Um, trying to create new kinds of collaborations, force people to think outside the box or think outside of their comfort zone, um, and so on. So that's uh, my sort of goal now, I would say. Um, so uh, that's all, um, and uh, yeah, happy to answer any questions. But. <laughs> Thank you so much, and sorry for the... Uh, no, that's fine. Yeah. Was working, then having Damn thinking. technical tools, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, um, thank you so much for the insightful uh, first yeah, starting off presentation um, mm. of, of our workshop. Um, I'm Lena Omar. Um, the discussant uh, of this presentation. Um, thank you for not me this morning. Just introducing myself briefly. Um, I was special planner by training and doing my PhD uh, there, also on the topic of digital sovereignty. Mm. And um, yes, um, thank you also for inviting me to the workshop. Um, for me, um, the concept of formativity, um, I've, I've not been trained uh, in performative research and research methodology, so I was reflecting a lot <laughs> on my way of becoming a researcher and what this might mean, and um, 
Yes, you already touched upon um, yeah, some of these aspects um, regarding your work, but what would be interesting for me, from my perspective, is um, yeah, backtracking it a little further mm -hmm. from uh, this point in your work. Uh, where, where did you first get in touch with this um, research philosophy or uh, research paradigm? And then, yes, uh, what were the moments and movements mm -hmm. that you came across um, while doing research, being a student? Um, and yeah, from then on, how did it influence your, your way and how you do research? Yeah, so how did I sort of come to this uh, point? So um, before doing this research, um, I uh, had lived for uh, several years and researched for a few years in uh, Honduras mostly, and I had, was really involved in, I think, much more um, directly activist research, right? Uh, issues around sort of land rights and um, and so on in, in, in Honduras, uh, specifically land rights around a, uh, a sort of libertarian Silicon Valley inspired uh, imaginary of a new city and uh, autonomous jurisdiction in Honduras. Basically, Peter Thiel was trying to colonize a little section of Honduras. And um, and so that's sort of where I came into contact with uh, with sort of activism against uh, Silicon Valley, right, I guess, was a uh, was through it was very much more uh, sort of directly activist research, uh, where my position as a researcher was quite different in that there were um, different kinds of power imbalances between me as a sort of privileged, you know, white North American male um, with mobility, right? Um, uh, I was able to, uh, working with, uh, you know, communities facing displacement, right, um, uh, in Honduras. Um, but my role in, in that research was often much more directly activist in that I would get information that I would share with uh, organizers, right? We would sort of write things together, we would strategize together, right? I spent a lot of time in human rights observers camps and so on, and so there was this much more, I was sort of very comfortable with uh, activist sort of research, I would say. Um, and I think actually when I started this research, I felt uh, like I wanted to be sort of more active. Uh, so I had a lot of ideas of how I could sort of contribute more uh, to what was going on in, in the sort of tech sovereignty um, sphere in Barcelona. Um, uh, but really the, the sort of community, the, uh, the sort of networks in Barcelona were just so far beyond <laughs> anything that I sort of imagined that, um, so I, the example that I always give is when I first went and started Kind of talking to people, I thought, well, you know, what can I really bring? Well, I'm a geographer. I have some basic GIS experience. Like I could, you know, there's a lot of uh, sort of alternative economy things going on in Barcelona, solidarity economy. Like I could make like a uh, an, some kind of an interactive community-based participatory GIS map of of, uh, of a solidarity economy things going on in Barcelona. And like six months later, it was like done. People had just done it themselves. They were like, oh, somebody's like, oh, that's a great idea, and then they just did it right and so and so uh, there are all these uh, and i would have taken me way longer because i don't have that good of gis skills and and people just sort of taught themselves and figured out how to do it and brought in oh this person knows and so um any idea that i had of like okay i'm going to really kind of be, take a more active role and, and sort of lead a sort of participatory gis project or something right all of that sort of went out the window when i realized that i just like really had a lot to learn from uh from these people and that uh, uh, they were sort of light years ahead of me in terms of uh, their thinking and their um, uh, the activities that they were sort of planning. And so I, I think I really did, as I, I said, sort of became came to realize that my role in that particular scenario was to be more of a, a learner and just sort of learn from, I thought, you know, there's something very interesting going on here. I think they often, a lot of the people I worked with often didn't recognize that what they were doing was so interesting and sort of assume that this was very common everywhere and I'd have to say like no like please share your thoughts on this because it's very very interesting and so uh, I think my role became sort of uh, yeah a sort of student um, whereas I, I went into it I think with this idea that I would be yeah more active and play this more active role which I had done previously in research so I think my reflection on that is that um, you know, it's important to sort of re reflect on every research scenario is different, and especially if you're doing any kind of community-based work or, or ethnographic work, how you fit in those spaces and, and, and how you relate to those different communities and those people 
is very fluid and can and shift quite a bit and, and depends a lot on the scenarios. And so, um, uh, yeah, I think I, I had to sort of reevaluate it several times what what I was doing and how I could, you know, and it was very much that I, I didn't have a whole lot of special things to offer, but I could definitely hang out in meetings and put an antenna on my roof and help, you know, run some cables up to the <laughs> up to the roof and connect somebody's house to the internet and I could learn to do those things but there was a, a learning process and for me that learning process I think was uh, was the, the research um, yeah I don't know if that answers the question but it does. okay yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it does. yeah thank you yeah. for the interesting uh, excuse I'll set up um, this yeah. frame of the presentation but um, yeah I would also I mean I appreciate the privilege to to uh, ask the first question but I think yeah we don't have that much time left so in oh, the remaining five minutes I would like to open the floor for yeah. maybe one or two more questions if we have time in the yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can start because I think this one aspect that you were talking about with um, not being from the tech world yourself and uh, and like I think this is something that, that it would be very nice to reflect on together mm -hmm. because I think it happens to all of us that we are engaging with things that we can understand and we can understand and then all of a sudden we hit this yeah. wall of the black box where yeah. we're just like, I don't, okay, I didn't understand. Yeah. And, um, and to like constantly hit against that wall and try to like shape what it is you're not understanding and how much do we need to understand yeah. it. Um, because that I can feel this on. from my, from my mm -hmm. own point of view of just, am I just scraping <laughs> <laughs> like with the, the surface constantly because there is so much more, yeah. especially when we talk about te uh, te um, tech, um, tech politics, like what is the politics yeah. behind it, if we would understand even further into the infrastructure and the coding and the yeah. architecture of these systems, what else could yeah. we see? And how can we start like unpicking or yeah. trying to like scratch open this back, back box? And, and at least how, or how, how can we start describing it very clearly yeah. um, to at least show where we're not capable, <laughs> 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 what, what we're not capable of talking yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Uh, this idea that uh, I very much relate to that idea of like hitting the, like, oh wait, I thought I understood how this works and then I'm totally lost, right? And so, I mean, I think it's, it's uh, there's a few good um, papers, I'm trying to think of the uh, now, but I think about uh, quite a bit where it's sort of trying to recognize that opacity is sort of a key to the way that some of these things work, right? And so sometimes it's not necessarily, I think there's a temptation to always open the black box or to try to open the black box or scrape at it. And I think there are moments where, where, yeah, there's moments where that's helpful and there's moments where it can be a dead end. And I think it's, it takes some practice to sort of know. Like, different sovereignty. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my feeling is that it, it does not always help to open the black box. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. My experience with interviewing is that those experts that I'm interviewing appreciate that I'm an outsider because I'm, that I don't understand their core business mm -hmm. because I do see things they don't see. Yeah. And that this is an opportunity for them also to reflect upon things yeah. they in their inside. Yeah. Beauty. Yeah, I think what, and I agree, and then I think uh, this is why it was a bit of a shock doing this research uh, because it was suddenly people were saying, no, 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 like I'm not, a, I'm not the tech person and this isn't the business person and this isn't the, it's like, no, no, we all do this together and we're all going to discuss all of this and we're going to manage this together and there's, you, it's really hard to sort of parse out what's the sort of tech side and what's the political question and what's the sort of economic question and, and all of this. And so um, it, conversations would sometimes move quite freely between like discussions of neighborhood politics and then like what kind of antenna we needed and then where you know how to relate to the 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 maker space and how to um you know uh you know it move uh, especially i was doing this research during the catalan independence referendum and a lot of the politics around that and so there'd be like 
a big discussion about a debate about independence and how to manage whatever and then say and then people discussing how they're going to connect polling places to the internet and like help uh, create the sort of secure uh, digital voter rolls for the illegal, <laughs> you know, uh, independence referendum. And so there was just like uh, uh, the constant sort of mixing of themes, right? That I think I was quite different from when I've whenever I've interviewed people in sort of industry, who are like, well, I'm the engineer, and my role is this. I'm the marketing person, and my role is this. Uh, the those bounds were so so much more blurred that it. it led me to have to open or try to open the black box in, in different moments in different ways. Um, yeah. We have time. Uh, anybody has a question? Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks so much for sharing your inspiring research and also your experiences becoming a digital subject. I was wondering whether you also um, reflect or whether you also became a digital sovereign, <laughs> um, or maybe to, to put it differently, yeah. I, I understood your presentation also as a plea for understanding tech sovereignty as knowledge practice. Yeah. And yeah. Um, where where is the affordances of the digital yeah. um, technologies themselves and uh, do you I, think you, you cope with that too? Um, I think it's a constant, yeah, there's a constant, there's constant tensions and, and, and conflicts. And this is something, you know, that I would see. I was very impressed by how advanced and how, um, you know, uh, extensive some of the networks were in Barcelona, but they would always run into these, uh, quite the limitations, right? The sort of choices that have to be made of like, um, uh, of yeah, the sort of limitations of their their sovereignty, right, or their limitations of the affordances of of the digital. I think one of the things that I think was quite interesting about this was it was a lot of these groups were obviously would you know engage this discourse of digital of tech sovereignty in their case, um, but a lot of people would say like there's plenty of things like plenty of times that we come up with questions and then actually there's no tech involved, no real technical <laughs> anything involved in what we're doing. We realize, oh, we have this, somebody came to us with this problem in the neighborhood and actually there's this cooperative down the road that's doing something really interesting. So we're going to work with them and then there's actually no tech going on. So there was like a number of times in which like the, the affordances of, I, I think sometimes uh, the sort of risk of this is that we end up centering the digital, right? And centering the technology as a sort of solution. Um, maybe as a different kind of solution or solution to different kinds of problems or sort of involved in solutions in different ways. But I think, um, I think the question of sort of the affordances of, there's a number of times where we would realize like, actually, you know, we can't do what we want, or people would realize we can't do what we want to do, or we don't need, <laughs> we don't need a, I think my, my classic one is like, we don't need a blockchain for this, right? Um, <laughs> was, was my favorite. Uh, I think we sometimes, you know, especially in 2016, it was a bit a slightly different time. People would sometimes say, oh, you know, maybe blockchain would be an interesting solution for this. We could really, you know, use blockchain for this, even in these sort of critical circles, like, oh, maybe it's blockchain. And I think often the solution was actually, no, we don't need a blockchain for this. I think we need to, like, go talk to the guy down the street, <laughs> you know? And so um, I think that's a, a, an interesting aspect of this is, like, uh, that the, the sort of, yeah, the sort of... Uh, uh, the role of technology or the digital in whatever kinds of sovereignties were being pursued uh, in Barcelona at this time. So tech sovereignty is one, but around this time there was a lot of discussion on energy sovereignty, health sovereignty, educational sovereignty. Like sovereignties were sort was sort of there was a book in Catalan called Sovereignties that came out around this time, and it, uh, from the sort of uh, anti-capitalist, pro-independence political party political platform and. Catalonia, so sovereignties were sort of all the rage and all different kinds of sovereignties and tech sovereignty intersected with these other kinds of sovereignties in a variety of ways, but uh, uh, I think uh, there's always a bit of tension, but often, um, you know, it was clear that tech wasn't always the solution, right? Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. I really enjoyed that and just thinking through your example. Um, I really appreciate that. And I thought it was so um, interesting to think through the notion of 
being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I just have to say, you're not alone. I've been feeling uncomfortable for five years now since I kind of started anything with tech <laughs> as an urban scholar. Yeah. Um, and I think that's it's actually a crucial thing to think about um, how we position ourselves in yeah. the fields as well, right? Yeah. I mean, uncomfortable being uncomfortable has to do with hierarchies that you pointed out, with uh, knowledge structures, with um, contact and yeah. interaction and connection and all that. So I was wondering, because I have that feeling as well, uh, not but also towards communities that I work with, uh, did you bring back the work that you did, the academic work that you did to this community? Was it like a fluid um, interconnectedness of the various fields that you interacted with? Um, or did you feel like it kind of I don't know, faded out in academia or more in activism? What's the slash between that that yeah. you far pointed to at the beginning? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, uh, so I definitely did, you know, bring back my thoughts on this to, to different people or different groups within these networks, but there's there's no like uh, I think I, I probably would have had it not been for, for COVID and moving and a bunch of other things, uh, gone to one of the like tech sovereignty conferences, as sort of community oriented conferences and sort of presented that was always a plan because I was very involved in that in that group during my research. Um, but uh, yeah, there's no like one place to, to kind of bring it to everybody. So there's a lot of like side conversations, a lot of like, this is what I'm thinking, a lot of, um, you know, I, I'm kind of write something like along these lines and, and having a lot more informal conversations um, with people. Um, yeah, I sort of wish I had had a, an opportunity to do more of like maybe more somewhat more formal presentation of things that I did um, in some yeah, some space where a variety of groups were maybe together, um, but there weren't, I didn't end up with too many opportunities with that partly through timing. Um, yeah, so in terms of how it's sort of, um, yeah, I think partly it's uh, it's it's sputtered out uh, in academia, but then also I, I you know, I, I've got involved in a number of more sort of design oriented projects and sometimes I'm able to sort of draw new connections between uh, you know, a sort of digital critical social work uh, group in, in Barcelona with like, you know, some people who are having vaguely similar ideas in the U.S. with people who are having vaguely similar ideas, else, you know, in other places where, uh, where I have networks. And so uh, I've been able to do a lot of sort of network building sort of uh, uh, between groups, which has been um, great. So I think there's quite a bit in terms of like the the outcomes of the work uh, are sort of hard to, to sort of, uh, I've never really done a quite an inventory of it. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I, I would have felt comfortable, uh, I, I felt totally comfortable going back to the groups that I worked in and sort of presenting my ideas of, of you know, or my take on what they were doing and hearing their impact, their input, because uh, partly because they weren't so tech focused, right? And so in a lot of these cases, right, you have groups that were started by people who really had no tech background themselves and were like, you know, I was an unemployed social worker during the economic crisis and realized that like, you know, we were getting screwed by big cable in our internet provider who was like not providing any good service and charging us way too much. And so I started a, uh, you know, consumer cooperative, uh, you know, for, for internet, right, sort of alongside the GeekyNet example. Um, and, you know, I had to go into these meetings with people from, uh, you know, internet service providers, and I would be sitting there on my computer, like Googling terms, trying to figure out what they were doing. Right. So a lot of the groups, a lot of people in the in these communities, uh, express similar kinds of concerns, and so I think that uh, allowed me to both recognize those uh, things that I was facing myself, and then also communicate a bit more freely with them. But uh, yeah, yeah, I'd say that's that's a bit what happened with me.